Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah Kareem. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Today's session is a very different Ramadan. And as our MC has pointed out, uh, this is meant to be an interactive discussion and a practical discussion uh, on our current situation. I'm sure all of us are aware of this, that perhaps the, for the first time in our lives, we're in a situation where Ramadan will not be taking place in the masjid. Uh, as a community, we, we will not be breaking our fast together in the, in the masjid. We will not be performing Sata Taraweeh in the masjids. And it's still up in the air. We might not even be doing Eid together uh, in the masjids uh, to celebrate the end of the year, to end of, uh, the end of Ramadan. So you could say that this is a difficult thing to accept for many of us. And it's, 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 a, it's a new situation. Uh, I've never, uh, I'm, I was born in California. I've never seen a situation like this before. Uh, and I think many of us have not seen a situation like this in our lifetimes. Uh, so the first, first aspect is, how do we approach this uh, Ramadan this year? And how do we cope with, how do we adjust, uh, how do we uh, accept the new circumstances in which we will be doing our Ramadan this year? So first of all, I think our outlook and our perspective on things is very important. We're uh, naturally, those of us who have attachment with the masjid, those of us who've been going to the masjid since we were young, uh, naturally we are feeling, feeling uh, experiencing some loss and naturally right, we are a little bit upset also at the current situation. Uh, being with a group, breaking our fast together uh, in, the, in the masjid, uh, performing a salat together, uh, it is a bonding experience and it's a, it's a communal experience as well. It, it is a group experience. And those of us who experience it, the, the spirituality inside the masjid and the blessings and that, uh, that, that spiritual high that we get in the masjid, uh, we, we normally don't see outside. At the same time, our circumstances this, for, for this year, inshallah, particularly, are different. Inshallah, hopefully next year we'll go back to normal. Uh, but again, I think that having the correct perspective uh, understanding the decree of Allah Ta'ala. And you could say this is our general advice that, that applies to many unexpected things that happen in life. Unfor we say unforeseen circumstances. Uh, we, we, we can call it uh, the, when life throws you uh, lemons, uh, then make lemonade. Right? What, what to do when difficult situations happen? What to do when unforeseen circumstances come about? Uh, so our perspective is everything. And having the correct perspective, having a positive perspective, uh, and uh, looking, Allah SWT is our creator. He knows what's best for us. Accepting the div divine decree and looking for the positives, looking for a uh, blessing in, in disguise, right? looking for the silver lining and looking at, at all, this whole situation as a blessing in disguise. Right? So as I was preparing this lecture, I've thought about it. Uh, in, I, I, I'm 41 years old. I've been married for roughly 19 years. Uh, I can count the amount of times I've actually broken the fast with, with my wife and my family. Uh, because all these Ramadans were growing up and, uh, and most of the other, of the, Ramad, uh, the, the fast in the, uh, most of the time while I was fasting in the, in the, during my marriage, I was always in the masjid. So I just thought to myself, this is probably going to be one of the few times where I'm going to be home with my children and with my wife and able to break my fast with them. So I'm just giving an example that uh, this, this Ramadan will be different, uh, but we also can see it as a positive. And we can also see the, the goodness and see the benefits of this. And personally, I think uh, perhaps this particular year is a wake-up call for us and it's an excuse for us to work on our spiritual environment in our homes. 
especially for those men who spend time in the masjid, uh, who enjoy their time in the masjid, who do itikaf, uh, who go to the masjid on a regular basis, and who spend hours and long periods of time in the masjid. Uh, perhaps this is now an excuse for us to turn towards our houses and focus our energy and focus our direction in making our houses just like the masjid. Right? Those of us who know, one of the reasons why we enjoy the masjid so much is that spiritual light, the angels are there as well, the mercy of Allah SWT is coming down. It's a very spiritual place. So why not replicate that same environment in our homes? And why not make our homes just like the masjid? And this, this year in particular, for any of us who have been negligent, uh, we know many of us are able to spend more time with our families. Uh, if we had been working full time and going to school full time, uh, we would not have been able to do so. Right? This, this situation has uh, provided families with excuse to spend more time together. And also this month of Ramadan uh, is opportunity for us, whether you call it excuse or opportunity, uh, it, is, it is definitely an opportunity for us to spend more time at home and spend more time worshipping Allah Ta'ala at home as well. So I wish to share with you a verse of the Holy Quran, which I found extremely relevant. It's not the exact, exact same situation. Uh, this verse addresses Bani Israel. And their situation was slightly different because they were, uh, they were also confined to their houses, but out of fear of death and out of fear of uh, the tyrant uh, Fir'aun and out of fear of being uh, murdered. So it's a slightly different situation. But Allah SWT says in the Holy Quran, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَى مُوسَىٰ وَأَخِيهِ أَن تَبَوَىٰ لِقَوْمِكُمَا بِمِسْرَ بُيُوتَىٰ So Allah SWT reveals, Allah SWT says that we have revealed to Musa al Islam and his brother. Settle your people in Egypt or settle your people in houses in Egypt. And the part which uh, relates to us is that Bani Israel uh, they had some unique restrictions upon them. And among the restrictions upon them, they, we, we, we know Musa a.s. <coughs> was also a prophet of Allah SWT, and his divine law, uh, we can call it the Mosaic law or the Talmudic law, uh, his, yeah, his law was different from, was similar to ours, but also different. It, it was a previous Sharia, it was a previous divine law. So there, were, there are some minor, minor differences. And among them, is that the people of Bani Israel, their worship was not valid unless it was in a masjid. So for them, it was all or nothing. Either perform your salat, salat in the masjid, your prayers in the masjid, or don't perform that, them at all. That was the normal ruling for them. Whereas we know from, from the, among the unique favors given to, to the, this ummah, this nation of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is ju'ilatil ardu li tahura. That the entire earth was made as a masjid for this ummah, that we are allowed to perform our salat anywhere in the world. So going back to Bani Israel, because of their fear and their real fear of, 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 uh, fear of uh, losing their life and fear of being persecuted, uh, they could not go to the masjids, and as a result, Allah SWT told them and told Musa al Islam <coughs> to tell them, qibla. and make your houses into masjids, make your houses into places which face towards the qibla. In other words, make your houses into places of prayer. And thereafter, Allah SWT says, salat. and establish salat. Worship Allah SWT in your homes. Right? If you're not able to do so in masjids, worship Allah SWT in your homes. وَبَشِّرِ mu'minin And give God tidings to, to, to the believers. Right? This is something to be sad about. Right? We, yes, those of us who are, have the attachment to the masjid, as the hadith mentions, وَقَلْبُهُمْ وَعَلَّقُوا بِالْمَسْجِدِ yeah, Among those people who will be under the shade of Allah SWT's throne uh, are those people whose hearts are attached to the masjid. So naturally, as believers, our hearts should be attached to the masjid. But at the same time, performing our salat at home 
is also a, a praiseworthy practice. Uh, and inshallah, in this current time, we should still get the same reward of performing salat at home as we, we should in the masjid. In other words, those people who would have normally gone to the masjid uh, on a normal basis, who are unable to do so right now, inshallah, they'll get the same reward for uh, of, of performing their salat in the masjid, even though they, even though they perform the salat at home. So, be happy, receive these glad tidings, and don't be sad over the situation. Don't be upset over the situation. Don't let it affect you. And I do wish to take out some time to discuss the important role which our houses play uh, in our spirituality, uh, in our religion, uh, in terms of our Islamic practice. And as I said, we, we as a Muslim community, we, we, we are generally negligent. And there's, put it this way, there's definitely room for improvement in the spiritual environment in our homes. Uh, not many of us can say, uh, that same spiritual vibe and the sp same spirit spirituality which is found in the masjid is also found in my home as well. Right? Our home environments, uh, the fact of the matter is, we spend more time in our home environments than we, than, than we used to do at the masjid, uh, than we used to do in the masjid anyways. Right? We spend the majority of our day in the, at home. We sleep at home. Uh, we spend our family time at home. Uh, so how can we replicate that same masjid environment in our homes? How can we make our masjid spiritually alive? And so this is an excellent opportunity for us to focus on establishing a spiritual home environment and, and divert that attention, use this month of Ramadan as a sp springboard and as a family, as a team, as a mother, father, children, relatives, how we can work together to build that spiritual environment in our homes, right? where people, everyone feels that spirituality, it's contagious. Sorry for the joke, you guys. So sorry for using that joke. But establishing such an environment where that spirituality rubs off. Right? I won't use the word contagious. Where that spirituality rubs off. And we also feel spiritual. Everyone, everyone around us is reading the Quran. Everyone around us is waking up for tahajjud, uh, doing dhikr, uh, listening to Islamic lectures. And we also, in that environment, we also feel like doing good. Our children are also positively affected. And as a family, as a group, right, we get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that, environment, that home environment is conducive. That home environment is inspiring and it brings us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's very interesting. Uh, I looked at a number of hadith on this topic, specifically on the home environment. And what did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say about the home and the role of the home. So we've heard, there's a famous hadith we've heard of regarding the benefits of doing dhikr and regarding the benefits of, of remembering Allah SWT. So the hadith is, It's a famous hadith, the example of the person who remembers Allah SWT, an example of the person who doesn't remember Allah SWT is like a living person and a dead person. In other words, that person who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alive, right? They are spiritually alive. And that person who does not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a dead person. They're like the walking dead, right? They're, uh, so spiritually, they are, they are dead. Even though they're, they're, they have life in them, even though technically uh, they can move around, but spiritually, they are dead. So that is a famous hadith we might have heard of. In another similar hadith, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, مَثَلْ بَيْتِ الَّذِي يُذْكَرُ فِيهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَمَثَلْ بَيْتِ الَّذِي لَا يُذْكَرُ فِيهِ كَمَثَلْ الْحَيِّ وَالْمَيَّتِ So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu extended that analogy or extended that principle to our houses. And he said, the example of that house in which Allah SWT is remembered and the example of that house in which Allah SWT is not remembered, is like the living and the dead. In other words, the house in which Allah SWT is being remembered, the Quran is being read, Salah is being performed, that house is like a spiritual, is, is, a, is a house that is alive. It, it is like a house that is spiritually alive. And on the flip side, that house in which Allah SWT's name is not remembered 
and worship is not, Allah SWT is not worshipped there, that house is spiritually dead. So, this gives us an idea of why we should be we should taking out some time in our houses, worshipping Allah SWT during our houses, and not just exclusively worship, worshipping Allah SWT in the masjids. Another really fascinating and thought-provoking hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, this is mentioned, in, uh, the similar hadith is mentioned in numerous books and in multiple hadith. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reported to have said, لا تتخذوا بيوتكم قبورة or لا تجعلوا بيوتكم قبورة Do not make your houses into graveyards. And also connected with that example of spiritually alive and spiritually dead, Respected friends, imagine uh, our thoughts regarding graveyards. Right? Graveyards are seen as uh, freaky places. Uh, no one wants to be caught at nighttime in, a, in near a graveyard. Uh, we, we, yeah, we, we don't feel uh, at ease. Uh, you're around, around dead people. Uh, it's not the most inspiring or the most positive place to be. So the Prophet Muhammad is telling us, your homes, if you're not careful, your homes will become like graveyards and they will become spiritually dead. So this also is motivation for us as well. Yeah, there, there's always two sides to things. One is the house which is spiritually alive. It's like a star. There's divine light. That house is a live house, is a spiritually live house. The other house is spiritually dead. It's like walking around in graves. Uh, there are people walking around, but they're, uh, they're spiritually dead. So in that same hadith, that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam discussed graveyards. He also gave us the solution or the treatment for not turning our house in a graveyard and how to avoid turning our houses in a graveyard. So in the same hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, recite Surah Baqarah in your house. And if you don't want your house to become a graveyard, recite the Quran in your house. And specifically, that house in which Surah Baqarah is recited, Shaitan will not come close to the house for three days. And so there are numerous hadith to this effect. Uh, but the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, by reading the Qur'an in our house, and by reading specific verses of the Qur'an, this will protect that house from, from shaitan. This will be an immunization. This will be a vaccine from shaitan to come in the house uh, for three days straight. Right? So imagine, that's three days of protection. Right? But right, no person imagine. Imagine us buying insurance three days at a time. What person is going to want to enter into an insurance contract or buy any type of insurance, whether it's a warranty on a car or warranty on a, uh, on a phone? What person wants only three days protection? Right? They want at least a year. They want a longer period of time. So how much protection we want for our houses is determined by the amount of Quran we read in our houses and by, by the amount of protection we purchase for ourselves by the amount of protection we ensure for ourselves by reading the Quran on a regular basis. And so this is really, I, I think it's really thought provoking and it should be really a moment of reflection, right? That how much Quran are we reading in our houses? How important it is to read the Quran in our houses. And that is why even the books of the Hadith mention. we think sometimes certain things are cultural practices, uh, but you, you may notice within our Many of us, our parents or grandparents, they would advise us. The first thing you do when you, buy, when you buy a new home or you move into a new home, you have the Quran read in the house. Right? Have any of you guys heard of this? This is something my, my parents have been telling me for some time. Uh, this isn't a cultural practice. The Sahaba, عنهم, as mentioned in, in, in books of Hadith, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, they would also do the same thing. When they moved into a new home, they would also start off on the right foot by reading the whole Quran. Right, so this plays an important role. Now, I know many people in the month of Ramadan, for example, uh, specifically between Asr and Maghrib, the masjid used to be packed with people. Right? Our, our masjid, uh, we used to have maybe 40 people, 50 people who were reading the Quran in the masjid between uh, Asr and Maghrib. Right? Why don't we take that same energy, take that same practice, and start doing it in our homes? Uh, normally, our, our, our wives or our woman folk 
our children are doing so. Now let's take all those practices we used to do in the masjid and start doing them at home. Right? So the Quran is extremely important. This applies to the month of Ramadan. It also applies outside the month of, of Ramadan as well. Uh, Mufti Kamani has also told us the important role of the Quran and Salat al right? Those, uh, Luckily, uh, hopefully, if we have a hafiz in our family, we can even do a Salat al in our homes, observing social distancing, observing small groups. Uh, but those among us who, who have hufaz, we can do Salat al at home. If we haven't memorized the whole Quran, then read as much as we know or read the last 10 surahs of the Quran. Right? But taraweeh, doing taraweeh at, at, at home is important as well. Uh, and it's a means of being blessings and, and the Quran being recited at home. Okay, the next uh, point that I want to discuss is also a second powerful way uh, to avoid making our houses in our graves and into uh, establishing a positive environment in our homes. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is reported to have said, Ij'alu min salatikum fi buyutikum, wa la tattakhiduha quburan, wa kama qala alayhi salatu salam. So a second means of not making our houses in their graves is to perform some of our salat at home. Now, the context of this hadith is the Prophet ﷺ strongly emphasized adult men should perform the salat in the masjid under normal circumstances. Under normal circumstances. Uh, but he, those same men, he wanted to encourage them, they should be reading some of their salat at home. In other words, the sunnah muakkadah salats, the nafil salats, the hajjud and so on. Uh, perform some salawat at home. So what's the objective? By performing salat at home, and right now in this month of Ramadan, men, uh, the men don't have a choice, uh, but by performing salat at by performing the other salawat at home, this also brings blessings to the house. This also changes the spiritual uh, equilibrium in the house. Right? We want a house which in which good is, is overpowers evil. And spirituality, good spirituality, overcomes e evil spirituality. So, the more good deeds we do in our homes, the more salat we read in our homes, the more dhikr we do at homes, uh, the more Islamic lectures are, 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 are taking place in our homes, the more learning and teaching is taking place in our homes, this positively contributes to the, to the, to the home environment, and it increases the blessings in the house. Right? So these are some uh, points for us that let us use this month of Ramadan to create a permanent change in a spiritual equilibrium in their houses. In other words, let us use this opportunity to establish a amazing home, a home environment and an amazing spiritual Islamic environment. It's mentioned about certain families. Right? Some of the pious people we know, they had a practice that worship would go on 24 hours in the house. Right? Just like people sometimes do shifts. Uh, but what, what they would do is one family member would, for example, do salat for two hours, then wake us, another person up, then they go to sleep. The other person would pray for another two hours. And that way, there was worship going on 24-7 at that house. We know families in the month of Ramadan, they compete with how much Quran they can read. Sheikh Muhammad Zakaria writes about this, alayhi, that some women are completing in the month of Ramadan, they're completing the Quran uh, 10 times, 15 times, 20 times, 30 times. Right? And I'm referring to reason, reading the entire Quran from beginning to end, reading the entire 830 pages, uh, 20 times, 30 times. People like Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, sometimes will read the Quran once a day. We we'll complete the Quran once a day in the month, uh, month of, of, of Ramadan. So, although we might not be able to do so in the masjid now, but let's take that same energy and start doing it in our homes. And as a, maybe as a family, set a goal. Uh, we as a family will complete the Quran twice in this month of Ramadan, inshallah. Or we as a family will complete the Quran, inshallah, five times in the month of Ramadan. Or inshallah, every family member in this house will complete the Quran once. Right? So imagine the blessings. Imagine the, the goodness and blessings and spirit, spirituality that's going to be established in the house. And this is also an excuse for husband and wives and for the family to worship Allah Ta'ala together. As I mentioned to, to many of you, uh, I don't remember the last time where I broke the fast uh, in home, at home uh, with my wife and children, right? Because I'm always, always at the masjid. So th these are some uh, 
practical advices or some uh, some points I wish to share with you. Uh, does anyone have any questions or does anyone have any uh, related points to this? Okay. okay, here's a question. Okay, if you didn't finish the reading the Quran, whole Quran last year, should you start off from that point this Ramadan or start over? Uh, so the, the person has a choice. Uh, they, they can continue where they, where, where they left off and then start again. Right? So that's uh, the Prophet ﷺ did mention a hadith. The most pray, praiseworthy of actions is to start the Quran from the beginning, to complete it, and after completing it, start it, starting again. Okay. Uh, there was also a question. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't get a chance to answer this earlier. Uh, someone asked a question about uh, a Muslim doctor who uh, during, their, their, during the month of Ramadan might have to treat a patient and they might have to, uh, for example, touch their bare skin or m maybe to, to operate on them. Uh, they might have to uh, see, see certain parts of their body or uh, touch certain parts of their body. Uh, so this will not break the fast and it will not negatively impact the fast uh, because it's done so out of necessity, right? Because a, a person to, uh, in, in, in Islamic law, there are certain exceptions based on necessity. For example, if a male doctor is a treating a female patient uh, and she has a part of the body that needs to be treated, uh, that male, male doctor will have to see that part of the body to treat it, to apply the, the, the medicine, uh, or to, to do the surgery on that part of the body. So that's the answer to, to that question. Uh, any other questions related to uh, the fiqh of Ramadan or related to uh, this different Ramadan which is coming up? Any questions or any, any comments? Okay. okay, here's a question. I heard you shouldn't talk about fasting. If someone asks if you're fasting, what should you say? Should you lie and you're, say you're not fasting? Uh, the hadith does state, if someone wishes to argue with you and fight with you in the month of, of Ramadan, disengage, do not uh, engage that person in, in argumentation and say, I am fasting. Uh, so, um, and especially sometimes uh, a person might be at work or a person might be in a situation uh, and they're offered food or they're offered water, uh, they can, they, it's permissible. They're allowed to, to let the person know, I'm fasting, I'm sorry, uh, I can't drink your water, I can't eat your food right now because I'm fasting. Uh, so technically, uh, a person can tell others. Uh, it's an individual decision whether they, they wish to tell the, to talk about their, the fact that they're fasting or not. Uh, that, that is up to them. Okay, and any other questions? So inshallah, with some cl closing points, may Allah reward all the presenters and all uh, everyone who's attending these programs. Inshallah, I hope uh, this will inspire and motivate all of us to, to make this Ramadan a special Ramadan and to really work on ourselves and work on our fasting. And as, as I said, this Ramadan will be different. It doesn't mean it's going to be worse than previous Ramadans. It doesn't mean that Ramadan is canceled for this year, as one, one, one of my friends said on the social media. Ramadan is not canceled this year. Yes, the form of it has changed. Yes, we'll be doing it a little bit differently, but it doesn't mean it's, it's uh, any less. It doesn't mean that it's not, uh, not as virtuous. Just we, we make the most of our situation and make, make the most of our circumstances. Inshallah, we will get the full, full reward. Uh, as I said, specifically for our home environments and specifically in this month of Ramadan, let us make the most of it in our homes. And... The family is only the, the, is the sum of the individual parts. So as a team, right, as with our children, with our wives, with our families, let us work together, let us cooperate, let us encourage one another, and let us work on building that beautiful Islamic environment in our homes. Right? Especially for our children, for the sake of our children, let us work on showing them Islam in, in, instead of only teaching them. Right? One is teaching them, one is showing them the Islamic environment, showing them that spirit of, of Ramadan and showing them the correct way of fasting. Right? There's, as Sheikh Tahir has also discussed, uh, that there's different levels of fasting and one is the required fasting and one is the desired or ideal fasting. The required fasting means you, you, st you stay hung hungry, you, you don't drink water, etc. But the desired level of fasting, the optimal and ideal level of fasting is to fast from all types of sins as well. Throughout the day, the whole month of Ramadan, fast from all types of sins. Right? And the extra prayers, Salat al in our homes, 
They're breaking a fast together with our families in our homes. Huh? Let us make the most of it. Inshallah, let us make this uh, month of uh, Ramadan special. And let us make this month special, Inshallah. Okay, so and, any questions or any, any, any comments related to this? Okay, when you're sitting and reading the Quran, are you required to do a sajda? Anytime you read that part in the Quran where a sajda occurs, or only when you're praying salat? Okay, so the, so the answer is, this is what's referred to as sajda the tilawat. Okay, there's about, there's a number of places in the Quran where uh, if a person reads this, they should do sajda. So that applies to salat and it applies outside of salat as well. And so, and ideally, it, it makes more sense to do it right then and there so you don't forget about it. But technically, a person can do it right later as well. So it simply means you're reading the Quran, you come across one of the sajda verses, they're written in the, in the margins. Uh, so you, if you come across one of them, uh, you can put your Quran uh, on a raised place, do the sajda, and then keep reading. Okay, any, any more questions? Okay, inshallah. So again, we'll, we'll make dua, and we'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this month of, of Ramadan, that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give for all, the, all, all, all of us who are attached to the masjids and our hearts are connected with the masjids and we are not able to pray in the masjids, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the full reward of performing salat in the masjid, even though, even though, though we're not able to do so. Right? Because our intention was to go to the masjid, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the full reward, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the true understanding of the value of this month of, of Ramadan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to do the rights or fulfill the rights of this month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa give us the ability to fast as uh, in the, the best way of fasting. May Allah subhanahu wa give us all the ability to read the Quran in abundance in this month. May Allah subhanahu wa give us all the ability to fast from all types of sins. May Allah subhanahu wa give us, give our families also that inspiration and that guidance to make the best of this month, most of this month of, of, of Ramadan. And inshallah, we also make dua for all those who are suffering through the coronavirus and from this situation, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects all of mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes this virus and removes the, the harms of this virus uh, from the people. And we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to go back to normal. And inshallah, hopefully within a short period of time, we're able to go back to our masjids. We're all able to go back to our prayers. And inshallah, hopefully by next, next year, inshallah, things will be back to normal. So jazakallah khair for all, all of you for attending. And shall I mail the accept? Yes, sir.